Welcome to 10 Fem, conversations with real women who are achieving success on their own terms. My name is Danielle, and my mission is to motivate and ignite you to execute on your goals. This podcast is for you if you are striving for resilience, equity, agency, and liquidity. Enjoy. Hey. <laughs> well, it's been three years, I think, that we've been talking about speaking and and getting to know each other a little bit better. Oh my God. Yeah. So much has changed. So much has changed. And I really, really appreciate you being my first interviewee, being Uh, tortured through this process for 10X Femme. And um, yeah, I remember when we spoke about this probably about two and a half, three months ago, I was walking up Nama High Street getting a coffee and I was like, oh, I want to get into this new thing where I'm educating young women and, and women who are just trying to navigate their way in the world and just learn, learn from all of us, all our experiences, and especially people like you who have been through so much and shone and just continue to be amazing and a source of light. Thank you. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> so um, what I really want to know is like your, your journey and like what did you want to be when you were a little girl, which is like yesterday, looking at you. Oh, God. Uh, I was 51 <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. I, I swear to God, since I turned 50, like my life has just become even more meaningful than it ever has been before. And I'm so grounded and so open and so connected. Uh, and that came with my age. Mm. Some people are blessed. They have that from very early on. I didn't, unfortunately. I think we. I started like that, but then it gets eked out of you. Mm. I've always been a really sensitive person and very sensitive child. And and sensitivity I know now is my absolute strength. And it isn't about being moved by things. It's about sensing rooms, sensing energy shifting, Mm. knowing who to avoid and who to connect with and things like that. So I was very like that as a child, but I've only just realized that I lost it. Mm. And now I'm back. So going back to being a child, Mm. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was the youngest in my year. So I left school at 15. I went to a local comprehensive and I loved English and I loved art and I loved drama to a degree, but I wasn't very good at it. And I was really, really shy. Um, But I'm a creative person, Mm. but I wasn't, nobody really told me that. So I didn't really know. Um, and I was musical as well. So I played a brass instrument and I played in the brass band with my family and, and I was very much involved with the brass band world till I was like 16. Um, and I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was extremely immature. Mm. Um, and when I left school, I I wasn't ready to work. And, um, and it was a, there was YTS schemes going on at the time and I decided I was going to try hairdressing and I did that for a couple of weeks and hated it. And then I said to my mum, I'm just not ready to go to work. I felt, I mean, I really was, I was still playing with my dolls when I was 14, you know, mm. I was. What was your childhood environment like? So you're mixed race. Yeah. So what was the dynamic between your parents? Were they together? Were they divorced? No, together. They're still together. My parents are together. I've got two sisters, one older, one younger. Um, my parents, it's a working class um, household. My mum and dad worked. Um, it was, you know, you know, we made do and mm. we did, my mum and did the, the best for us. I mean, that my definitely in terms of work ethic, I, that was instilled into me. Mm. My dad was extremely political. So he stood for the Green Party in the local elections. He was always on, he was always left. He was, all, you know, Labour, I think maybe he ran once, but he was Liberal, Green Party, blah, blah, blah. So he, and he's the kind of guy that writes to the local council to make change. You know, mm. he still does. And, yeah. and your mum? And my mum. from? She's from Rajasthan. Uh, she was born there. She came to England when she was 11. Her parents are Anglo-Indian also, and their parents and their parents and mm-hmm. their parents. Um, and so she came to England. Yeah, she's she's 20 years older, old, older than me, exactly. So she came here when she was 11. And I, you know, I was... I, I didn't really know any other environment. I, I guess sometimes I was picked on at school because if I, over the summer holidays, if I was, if I got brown, which I do get really brown, mm. um, people would pick up on it and say things to me that weren't particularly nice, but it wasn't, it wasn't relentless and it wasn't too painful. I was also extremely shy, very thin, mm. um, 
Do, do you feel connected to the Anglo-Indian side of you? I am Indian. Like, I know yeah. my Indian roots are in me. I yeah. feel it. And then I went to India and I just thought, I mean, everybody kept saying all the time before I was going, brace yourself for the smells, brace yourself for the poverty, brace yourself for this, 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 and this. And I got there and I was like, home. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to brace myself for realities of life. There is poverty in mm -hmm. this world. I want to see it. I don't want to see it. But do you understand it's there? Yeah. So it's not a shock to me. It is life. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have to brace myself for shit when I went to India. I was just in it and felt that I just connected to who I actually am. So when I see you, I see a mixed race woman, but I think a lot of people probably don't, they don't or see don't it. associate you with having any heritage other than being British. No, I mean, people have said, you yeah, call me an English rose. I'm like, have another look. <laughs> have another look. Well, you have the blessing of being able to tan like me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, I, I love it. I mean, I, I absolutely love it. I feel better when I'm brown. But, you know, it's just, yeah, people just don't don't see it. Yeah. But yeah. people don't see a lot of things. People see, they only see what they've been told about me. Um, and then, yeah, I've, I've just, it's like in the, in the press, I, I'm always like a cartoon character. I'm not like a three-dimensional mm. person or four-dimensional, whatever I am multifaceted individual as we all are mm. they just but, want to portray you the way they want to portray yeah, you yeah and and, and I, you know the british press don't want to say i'm mixed race maybe because they want to just think i'm white and i'm on tv mm -hmm. and that's me done mm -hmm. and actually well no i'm not white yeah you know i never on those forms that you have to fill out for absolutely everything if, if, if there's only other i just put other yeah yeah because I am other, because I'm actually, I did a DNA test last year and I'm a million things as we all are. I'm not even just Indian and English. Yeah, I thought I've I was Ghanaian and yeah. I'm not. You're not? <laughs> Shit! No! So my dad did it recently as well and we're all like questioning like, hmm, so where are we really from? How interesting. Well, what yeah. did it come up with? Um, so uh, Togo and Benin, somewhere Cameroon, a bit of Nigerian. Ah! <laughs> Just everything, bit of Irish, bit of English. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've got a lot of Irish on my dad's side. We didn't even know that. We yeah. didn't even know that. I'm, be, I'm a big, big percentage Irish, big percentage English, obviously. Indian too, but also Italian. And um, and I was expecting Portugal for some reason because, I, well, I'm sure family history, somebody told me that somebody came over from Portugal to go or la, la, la. No Portuguese. And I've been supporting um, Portugal in the football <laughs> because Ronaldo was playing for them. And I'm like, yeah, I'm Portuguese. <laughs> I'm not Portuguese. I've got no reason to follow them now, apart from, yeah, that, apart from which the, I still the, will. The cute guys, obviously. I mean, obviously, he's just moved to Man United <laughs> and I'm just like, wow, I'm back on the football tip now. So when did you start modelling and how did you get into the, the broadcasting industry? I'll try and do this in a really short-handed mm. way is that um, when I was about 17 or 18, I suddenly started to blossom and people started to notice that. I was looking attractive and people would say to my mum, your daughter's beautiful, maybe she should be a model. When my mum suggested it to me, I was like, what, me? Mm -hmm. I didn't even think about it. Um, and um, I sent some pictures to a model agent. And at the time, you know, I, I was really into blue mascara because of Princess Diana. <laughs> and um, I, had a, I had a perm because I knit my hair dead straight. Mm. And at the time I wanted it a bit fuller, so to blow dry it out and... The model agent just said, you know, ditch the perm, get rid of the blue mascara and we might have something. And that's exactly what I did. And within a year, I was in London because mm. when you're in Manchester, you had a set amount of money per day. It was 200 quid a day for a modelling job. Whereas there were girls coming up from Manchester who were being brought up on the train, paid for, staying in hotels and were on 800 quid a day. And I thought, what the hell? This is insanity. Plus, I met somebody who lived in London. So I just moved to London. And then I, so I've been, I've been in London since 1989. Wow. Yeah. So, um, and I just, and I just worked. I, I, I just worked and I, I couldn't move in front of camera. I was, I was really, really shy, but mm. you just have to learn to loosen up. But I'm still not comfortable in front of cameras. It's not, you know, you've got people that just have that thing. Mm. I need to do some work on that actually, because I don't, Actually, recently, and I will go off on tangents, so apologise and sorry for the editor. <laughs> sorry. But I had, <laughs> last, last Saturday night, somebody said to me, Melanie, you need to listen to more music. Because I can't listen to yeah. music when I'm working because it's, I find it distracting. But um, the other night, it was Saturday night, the boys were with the father. I'd watched a movie. I put some music on and I danced in my living room for about an hour and a half to mm. all the different genres that I love. I love that. 
and um, there's reggae in there. There's Nirvana. I mean, actually, reggae is the only music that I can instinctively move to. It's mm. really interesting that when I've been there to all those Caribbean islands, that that the rhythm of the islands is seeps into mm-hmm. me. It's unbelievable. So I and know it's in- the intent of the music too. It's supposed to, you're supposed to feel it in your bones. You're and supposed I do. to move with it. And yeah. I do, and I do, and I think in some past life, oh, you know, mm. I was there. So I need to let go of that because yeah. I am very mindful. But it's been, because yeah. I'm in front of a camera all the time, you do get a little bit um, self-conscious. So that's interesting. So when you were doing your modelling, obviously you said you were shy and then you got pulled into broadcasting. So how painful was that for you? Like what was your, that growth curve yeah. that you had to go through to feel confident speaking in front of a camera and being able to speak confidently, not worrying about tripping over your words. and Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I think what people miss about modelling is that you are, I did it for eight years, mm. you are meeting different people mm-hmm. every single day, not one day is the same. Mm-hmm. Um, you you meet complete strangers at an airport and you, you're flying off to Africa and you're doing a two-week trip yeah. and you fly back. And your communication skills are key. Yeah. Uh, nobody wants to take uh, a beautiful girl, don't care how she beautiful she is, nobody wants her to come on a trip if yeah. she hasn't got the personality. Mm-hmm. I think people miss that. Personality is very much to do with if you're booked or not. Mm. Um, and whether or not you're engaging. And how do you find, so I just used the word just modelling, which was subconscious, even yes. though I didn't even though I didn't mean for it to sound uh, like I'm diminishing yeah, no, your no, experience, no. but do you think people do assume that and, and do use the word just with the a different intent with yeah. how I used it just now? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess people think it's some kind of like meaningless um, a job, but at the time it was what was on offer to me. Mm. Having not done so well at school, um, I have four O-levels. It's just not going to... I wasn't a scholar at that time. Now Mm. I am. Now I read, 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 study, study, study. That's all Mm. I do now to educate myself for the next phase of my life. But then I was just... I was I was a child in the true sense yeah. of it and I wasn't ready for it all. But the travel was an education for me. Mm. The meeting older people, understanding the industry, what sells, what doesn't sell, what makes a great shot, what what lighting there is, what mm. goes on in the countries that we're traveling in. I didn't sit there as some kind of empty vessel mm. going like this you know I'm a human being in this crazy beautiful experience and I have to say that all the women I met on in that industry were supportive and wonderful mm. there is no room for jealousy every other person is more beautiful than you mm. but you celebrate them mm-hmm. you set well I did or at least you think they're more beautiful than you. And I think we all do that. We always assume someone is better well, and more glamorous. And Yeah, I, do you know what? I'm saying that in a way that I, I didn't think they were more beautiful than me. Mm. I'm just saying that everybody is... On a level. Yeah. yeah. And it's not... I've, I've never been in competition with anybody. I uphold and support. So when anybody... You could go to a casting and it'd be literally round the block with girls waiting to go in. And one of you is going to get that gig. You mm. can't take that personally. Yeah. You weren't right for it. End of story. And congratulations, that girl who was yeah. right for it. Bravo. Yeah. You know, and that's how I operated. And then after eight years, I was trying to do modeling in uh, in Paris. I was, I'd was done Paris on and off, but you have to be extremely thin. You have to do catwalks in order to get Vogue and Elle and all that and to be noticed. And I did some big shows. I did a Karl Lagerfeld show. I was picked up by big, big designers. But... I had to starve myself mm. essentially to, to to really be on on that on that catwalk, and it just doesn't suit me because for me, I mean, sex, food, travel, these are the things that make me happy. Mm. I don't take food away from me, otherwise, I'm not existing. Yeah. And I, re- I remember ringing my agent, just saying, "I can't do this anymore. I miss my food. I want to come home, and I just want to be a commercial <laughs> model." Yeah, I couldn't cope. It's, I'm all about the food. Yeah, I'm carb queen. Yeah, me too. I'd <laughs> try no not to. <laughs> So, like, 30 years in the broadcasting industry. Like well, 25, what is 25, I don't want to add an extra five years to your yeah, life. No, well, I mean, no, but yeah. Yeah, I was like, doing something before then, but yeah. Yeah, like, what's, what's your biggest takeaway from it? Like, what would you suggest to anybody who wanted to do it? Well, I, I would suggest don't do it. I mean, because I don't. it depends what you want to do it for. The reasons yeah. I did it was because I was modelling. I did a commercial for a beer 
uh, that became very successful very quickly because um, because it was popular. It was already a popular product mm. and, the, and the concepts for the adverts were extremely popular already. Um, they were award-winning scripts, you know. Even some of the scores were award-winning. Mm. One of my adverts, the score, got an award. I mean, it's extraordinary. So um, it just got seen, it got noticed. And, and my agent was getting phone calls from all sorts of um, different production companies and channels saying who is she can she come in for a screen test and I kept going in for screen tests and I kept getting everything but not really wanting to get everything but just thinking you know what just go see go see go see what it's like and then you know not really enjoying it though and Mm. I'm finding it a bit vacuous if Mm. I'm honest would you change anything though so you're you got sucked into the broadcasting industry but would you change anything? Would you go back and do things differently? No, no, no. Okay. No, no, because I, I've suddenly realised in the past sort of year that everything that you, your history was mapped out. Yeah. And, and it shaped my, who you are now. And it shaped who I am now anyway. So I, I said yes to it for reasons. Mm. My experience within it were for reasons. Mm. Um, but, but the byproduct of doing it is quite toxic and poisonous. Mm. And, and it affects your family and your relationships and your children and how that works and the invasion mm. and the, the loss of your anonymity and your privacy. Um, so anybody that's going into to be famous, really think about that because yeah. it's a really shitty byproduct of a job. Mm. And I've said it before that presenting shows is a job. It's a job. There's a lot of preparation that needs to be done, a lot of discipline that you mm-hmm. need to have in order to make it look so relaxed and happy and for people to want to engage with it. When you're hosting a format show, there's no room for your personality, really. It's about the format and getting from A to B to C to D to E to thank you very much and good night. Mm. It's not fulfilling, but it is a function and you do it and you can do it and you manage to bring some warmth to it. I rather feel that that's what I did. So fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, I'm not even thanking anybody because you don't book me if I'm not good at it. I'm a commodity to them. You know, and um, the, in the industry, it's a really weird uh, take in that the presenter is the bottom of the rung, then it's the production company, and then it's the channel. Well, actually, it's not that. It's all on a level. And I think the minute we work that out, the better it's going to be for everybody's experience. And what's your experience been with other women? So you said in the modelling industry, all the women were supportive, but in the broadcasting industry, is it different? It's it's not different. I've not, I haven't got any famous friends. I, I know a lot of famous women. I know because because I'm in the industry for a long time. So I'm, but I also, but all of my friends aren't in the industry. My closest friends are in the industry. I'm not even sure why that is. It's just the way it's rolled, mm. um, and that's fine, uh, you know. And I support um, a lot of the women in the industry. What what where I'm at now though, I wonder. All these women who are in the public eye and who are um, really in strong positions aren't promoting positive sustainable ideas Mm. that's what I don't understand they're selling the dress that they're wearing that day Mm -hmm. to appear on a really important news channel or a really important daytime show or whatever they're they're promoting this dress that's really toxic to the environment Mm. but not talking about anything important so Mm. they're so, you know, well done you. You're getting to pay your mortgage. You're getting to look after your, your kids. And we've all got to do that. But actually, what are you doing for the world? Yeah, your responsibility. So coming on to the Frank Frank magazine then. So you launched that in 2019 as a two-woman band, which is just epic. Yeah. And I know it well. Yes. <laughs> I know it very, very well. Are you written for us? Yeah, it's absolutely stunning. And... You are now relaunching it with the sustainability angle, which must be incredibly important to you and for you for a number of reasons. But talk me through why it's so important to you. Well, it's been a really, honestly, I'm supercharged at the moment and everything seems to be on this crazy fast track, fast track. But obviously the pandemic hit. Mm. The magazine was two years old during that period. Um, And... There was big changes in my life. I realised what was important to me and actually, and, I, and I've said it before, obviously it is a tragedy what's happened and all the deaths that have happened. But in terms of how I had to relive my life, I actually got back to how I like it, mm. how I'm most comfortable. Mm. And I started to think about the magazine. It was always a roadmap out of the industry I was in anyway because I really wasn't enjoying it. Um, and then I thought, how can I um, take it to the next level and be- it become my career and leave TV and radio behind? 
And that was to put it as a website to extend the audience to all women because all women's voices are important to me and to the world right now. There's a huge shift going on, isn't there, I think, in terms of, and I hate this phrase, I don't hate the phrase women empowerment, but I think it's so overused and it's become watered down because it's so overused. But that's one of the things that's so fascinating about the platform for me, because it's not just a magazine. You are growing it. It's got many, many, many layers. And I think you've got a lot of goals for it to just be a lot more impactful and supportive of, of women. So oh. just tell me more. So it's from lots of levels. It's it's any, any woman that's doing something amazing in the world, whether she's writing novels mm. or, you know, is an artist or a businesswoman. I mean, we, we've managed to secure... Um, an interview with Anne Bowden, who set up her own bank, Starling Bank. Mm. I mean, hello. I want these women's journeys in my magazine to, to ignite other ideas in other women to go, well, she can do it, I can do it. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm sourcing um, interviews with really exciting women that are just movers and shakers. Mm. Um, it's also environmental. So any products that are going to be on there have to be sustainable or at least trying to be sustainable. Not saying they are and not fucking doing it, sorry. Yeah, yeah. But there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that going on. But actually, actively only dealing with how we can reduce our carbon footprint, how we can change how we live on a daily basis. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm passionate about it. I, I see it. I can't unsee it. I've, I've looked at how I live my life in detail. I, I don't even have a car at the moment because I realised the car I had was a gas guzzler. It wasn't even a hybrid. What am I doing? I sold it. Mm. I'm not consume, consume, consume anymore. I'm, I'm thrift shopping. I mean, I bought this yesterday. It's £10 from a second-hand shop. It's hand-stitched. It's who, would, who would let <laughs> this go? Um, I just can't... I just can't live my life now with blinkers on. It's everything I see. I'm very mindful. Like even my teeth floss stuff was in mm. plastic. I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah. So I'm sourcing the change. Are you paying homage to your father as well? Because I think you said that he was an activist. Well, it, well, it is, and this is another thing. This is like a big circle because I came back to the fact that my oh my god, my father's been talking about this since I was a child in the seventies. Yeah. And we weren't even in, in the crisis that we're in now. We had an ozone layer problem that got sorted by people going, yeah, you're right, signing a load of things and it got resolved. Why aren't we doing that now? Mm. Because now we are in this greedy, greedy, horrible world where money is king and people are nothing. Um, and also everybody's brainwashed, mm. brainwashed into thinking that somehow we aren't, we aren't the earth and yeah. that we aren't part of it we're superior on it and mm. and, and but you just have to switch the news on to see that the climate crisis is actually happening today it's not some concept that we need to tap into it's just happening yeah are you um, going to be supporting and kind of um, highlighting apps and things like that that people can use yeah. to monitor their carbon footprint and the change the small changes that we can make every day yeah, well, I didn't, do you know what? We have, we, we have a section, we're calling it the hub, and we're going to have all the things to read, all the things to watch, mm. and that'll be podcasts and, and all the rest of it. But, you know, I hadn't thought about apps. That's, mm. that, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> apps right. really should be on there yeah, as well. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, there's, thank there's you There's quite a that. few coming up now, actually, where you can collect points and things for making a difference to the environment. Oh my God, that's so, amazing. So thank you. Yeah. So this is what I mean. And like, we have such a small team, so there's only a certain brain amount of brains on yeah. there. I mean, we've, we've grown to five women now. It was two and now it's five, including me. And it will grow. And and the, and the, the thing as well on top of all of this is that I'm not a natural businesswoman. I mean, it's so funny. Somebody said something to me on, the, on Instagram this morning about, oh, yeah, well, you know, you're a millionaire. And I'm not a millionaire. I live hand to mouth. I've been over generous. I've, I've, I've had expensive divorces. I am the breadwinner and always have been. Mm. I've made mistakes. I've had feast and famine, which the industry that I live in is. I, I've said no to more than I've said yes to because I've always been ethical about my choices. Mm. Do you think that's something that's been deep-rooted in you from your parents? Yes, I'm, you working, just... I'm a working-class girl and yeah. I care about people and yeah. what the, the planet I live on. And I can't do anything that's not true to me. Mm. You can see it. I have no poker face. Mm. You know, I have to have a reason for getting involved with something. And, and, and more recently, I got involved with a product against all my instincts and it went to shit. 
Because that's what happens when you don't do you anything didn't listen authentic. To your gut. And that is a key, key, key yeah. tool in my life and is in all of our lives if we can just trust that our gut instincts, everything we need to know is within us. Yeah. And we ignore it all the time. And we ignore it all the time. I don't anymore. Mm. I don't anymore because at my peril, I do. I've started writing down when I don't listen to my gut as a reminder, as I told you so, because I think we tend to forget. We remember in the moment and go, oh, crap, I knew this was going to happen. Yeah. Or I could see this. Mm-hmm. But then we forget. So I now start writing it down in my journal to That's say, amazing. this is how I felt afterwards. And, and it's actually a physical reaction, yeah. isn't it? You, you feel it when you're just like, what did I do? Yeah. Yeah. And I a lot of us do it and we call them red flags in relationships. Yeah. But actually there's red flags in life across the board. Yeah. And when you feel it, see it, you just sit with yourself for a little while and don't act on it mm. until you're certain that you're doing the right thing. But we're all, not all, but it is, it's knee jerk. It's like, yeah, nobody's taking time to just sit. Yeah. There's so many questions I want to ask you around your um, personal relationships in terms of boundaries and things, but just on the Frank platform, what what impact do you want to make? Like, where do you see it in the next five years? Well, for me, it's it's a platform for other and bigger things. Yeah. Um, obviously, for me, it's an education, and I, it's an education for me and for the reader because it's a journey that will go on together because I'm not sitting here going, I know everything about um, the environment and I know everything about everything and I'm just going to show you. I'm actually learning. Mm. So I'm on the same level as the reader. From that, though, I want to start making some documentaries about the stuff that's on the mm. website. And I have six, seven, eight ideas about documentaries that I want to make. And it's really interesting because it's not necessarily because I want to present them because I don't really. Because as discussed, I don't mm. really like being on camera. But what's becoming more and more apparent to me at, lately and what people keep telling me is that you need to be presenting these mm-hmm. because your voice is so strong. And it's your baby and it's what you're passionate about. And I don't think anyone else can do the service to the messages that you want to put out if it's not from yourself. Yeah. And it's it's kind of an inconvenience for me because I don't yeah. want to, but I've got to own it. I've got yeah. to start owning this voice that I have. I did talk, tell you before we started filming that it is, it's become very apparent that um, I have a stream of consciousness that comes out. I don't edit before I say anything and it all just comes out and that is passion Mm -hmm. and so if that's what it takes to get the message across I'm going to have to use myself to do it yeah I'm so excited for you (laughs) honestly I'm excited for us actually because I want to go on that journey with you yeah exactly and you're on it and we're doing it and we're all doing it and that's the thing we're all able to do it we just have to be on it's a tribal situation so I think one of the things that I've I've heard from you is that your environment has been very challenging. You've had to interact with many different types of people and be placed in situations that you're not 100% comfortable with, but you're doing it because it's a job. So because you're such a spiritual and kind of self-connected person, how do you protect yourself from other people? Like, what are your, the boundaries? I think we had a conversation probably about six months ago around you really streamlining your friendship group for example like yeah how, how did you get there was it a conscious effort was it just an evolution of just fuck, these people are annoying yeah like, was it was it a conscious choice well I've spent my life letting people crash into my solar plexus mm. and it's the only way I can describe <laughs> it but it was it was interesting I remember years ago somebody just saying to me just if when somebody because I'm sensitive so mm. the, I feel the pain of somebody's anger I feel it in in their voice in their vibration and somebody was like you know just put your hand over your solar plexus when that person mm. comes in explain that to me what's what's I should know this what is the solar plexus well it's a chakra isn't yeah. it it's your and, and if you let people in it can really disturb mm. your sense of balance and and I'm and, and my heart heart is really open as well in fact I've just recently had um a treatment and my third eye is ridiculously wide open mm. as well so everything's like this with me and she had to shut me down a little bit just to protect myself oh, wow. um, super exciting so a lot of people call that woo woo yeah yeah they do <laughs> but but I, um, i've never called it woo woo yeah. but i've just never i've never tapped into it now i get it yeah now yeah, i totally get yeah, it yeah. and i'm like god i know what that was all about now when i read that i was like oh i want to tap into that mm. now i'm there 
So I need to follow in your footsteps because I did say in 2022, I was going to get a bit more woo woo. <laughs> <laughs> I need a bit more balance. And I think that I'm also, I'm, I'm a bit disconnected right now, generally, because obviously work and everything else. So I'm going to be knocking on your door so that you can walk me down that. But yeah. In yeah. terms of your boundary. So you're shy. You're now connected to your third eye. Before that, was it just you reacting to incidents and, and people that you started cutting people off or... I got really good at what what I would do is I would give I would invest too much time in people that weren't serving a good purpose for me or themselves even and yeah. a lot of people will continue to do something even though they're uncomfortable themselves and it would take me to to go this needs to end right now yeah. because the other person won't do it and that's been whether it be romantic relationships but I've had it with women as well where in the past four years I've had women cross boundaries with me so much that I've had to get rid of them mm. but they've almost um deleted themselves from my life yeah. by some behavior that's manifested yeah. that I will not tolerate. Yeah, yeah. And I, I realized I can't trust this person. Um, people have wanted to be around me for the elevation it gives them and all the rest of it. it it's it's taken, now, now what's happened is I'm fast tracking it all. Mm. Whereas I used to just, I used to give people one, two, three chances because I believed in them because I see the good in people. The, when I look at people, it's all I see. Mm. And, and what I've learned to do is not accept that at face value, but let them prove themselves to me. And if you do, you're in. But if you don't, you're out. And it's no longer three chance. It's one strike and you're out with everybody and everything. Because it has to be. Because if I continue to allow that in to poison me, to hurt me, I'm not operating on full power. And then what use am I? To me, my kids, mm. my life, all the quests that I have to help other people are on a back burner because I'm in pain. Yeah. Fuck that. Yeah. So, yeah, it's happened naturally as well. Yeah. And, and you just touch on, you know, your, your kids. You've been literally violated. I've seen it in the papers everywhere for years and years and years. So the boundaries are important, but especially around having two boys. So how how have you managed that situation, their perception of everything that they read or people might tell them about? Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting with, with Valentino because Valentino is autistic. So I'm I, he's not aware of the news. He doesn't read the news. He doesn't go online. Roman, another extraordinary human being, he isn't on social media. He doesn't, he's, he's on his own path. I mean... They're amazing children. They mm. have been impacted with people wanting to know about me. So, you know, Roman has been asked at school and asked questions about me. He doesn't, no, no teenage boy wants to talk about their mother full stop. Mm. Let alone a mother that's been written off as some kind of sexual fucking deviant. <laughs> but <Amen>. they. <laughs> and what's wrong with that? No, I'm exactly. joking. Um, but but you know but but what I love now is Roman, Roman's in a, in a relationship of his own and he in it and where I'm able to talk to him about a million things. But you've got to remember as well they get mum, they get me, they get the woman that I am daily. So the newspapers, mm. it's obvious to them the new newspapers are bullshit because <laughs> they've had me for 19, 17 yeah. years as this person. Yeah. So you don't even need to tell them don't listen to that no. because they, they're sensible enough to know that's not my mum. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and in terms of my career, they're uncomfortable to watch anything that I do. So I'm like, I'm on telly tonight. Do you want to see it? No, I'm not interested. I'm not talking about it now. I don't even tell them mm. what I'm doing anymore. They're Are you uncomfortable to watch yourself on TV? No, no, no. I actually, what I do is I fast track to see how I've been edited because yeah. that's important to me yeah. because like I'm on, I'm on shows at the moment and the experience does not reflect the edit. Mm. It just doesn't. I must say, I'm just really pissed off that you didn't bring any food to my house. Oh, well, I will do. <laughs> First I will... of all, cakes. No cakes. No cakes. Sorry, no, I came into the house. I am. But this is the thing. I am rubbish at that sort of thing. I'm good at a million other things, but I'm not like a hostess and I'm not mm. very good. I forget to bring things. Like no, I should have no, cooked. I no, I know. I know you're I just joking. mean like, I know you can cook. No, I, I can, can cook. But you could come over and, and I'll cook for you anyway. I can't cook for shit. No, but do you know, can I just tell you, MasterChef has actually knocked the passion of cooking out of me. Since I did that show... I, because, well, I don't even want to go into details yeah. about it, but I've lost my love of cooking from oh, doing gosh. that show, which is a tragedy. I will get it back because I've got to, and I'm, I'm feeding the kids daily and as I always do. Thank God. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I know, because then, you know, social service would be on the back. But basically, yeah, it's it, it's a TV show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it wasn't a nice experience. 
Um, so where were we? So boundaries. So boundaries, yeah, yeah they're up and running, man. They're up and running. Um, it's instinctual. And I have this voice now that I can just say, I mean, I had it on the street. Let's talk about how um, sexual harassment for just mm. a second which I've had to endure my entire life, yeah. and I'm sure you have, and I'm sure most women have. In fact, every woman I know has had shit on the street with some dude who thinks mm. it's okay to say. Or at work. Ha- or at work. Yeah. Or at work. And even the other day, I'm walking down the street, and it's quiet street, and I'm on my own, and there's a guy there. And as I, and it's always when you're just about to walk past them, because they never do it to your face, because they're yellow belly bastards. But they do it just as you're about to go past and he goes, nice, in a really disgusting sexual way. And I was nervous Mm. and it was a quiet street and I just kept walking. And then 20 minutes later, I came back because I had to walk back that way to go home. And I'd been to the post office and picked up some groceries and he was there again and he went to start on me again. And I just said to him, You need to know how threatening it feels when you talk to me like this out on the street. It's not nice. I don't want to know how you feel about me. It makes me scared. And he went, all right, all right. So he went from wanting to fuck me to wanting to kill me. (laughs) Oh, my God. And with no in-between. And that happens all the time. The minute he's... And I do now. I had it... I had it yesterday. Yeah. Somebody... Again, I was with my son and he went... Oh, you're gorgeous, like in the most disgusting way. And I went, you know, I'm with my son. Do you think that's appropriate to yeah. talk to me? You think it's a compliment? It's actually really inappropriate. And he, again, went straight to anger. And defensiveness. Yeah. Yeah. So you, so one minute is, and the next minute, I'm going to kill you. This is the majority of men. I'm sorry, but this is the no, majority of men. No, it is, absolutely. I've, I've been there on the street, even at work. Yeah. Although at work, it's a lot more passive yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. It, it's almost more difficult to um, respond to because you wonder if you've imagined it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there, yeah. There is a lot as of that. Opposed to, as opposed to it being as coarse as on the street. You'd, you'd have thought that after the the Me Too movement, that men would be a lot more aware of their behaviour and their impact But that's if they're us. even reading about Me Too, though, yeah. are they? They're yeah. not, are they, though? No, they're not. They're, they're, they're not. They're, they're just, uh, just morons. Like, yeah. just emotional morons. And... And I'm, I'm sorry, but like, I don't know if it's a culture in this country, but, you know, not all men. Obviously, it's not all men, but as they say, it's all women, though, that experience this mm. shit. And and also there is an element of women that love to be wolf whistled at. They, it gives them... Well, mm. what I'd say to those women is find your sense of self within you. You do not need to be told by some complete stranger that you're fuckable. Mm. Know that you are. Mm-hmm. Own it and give it to the person that respects you. Mm. It's interesting you should say that because I think I was a bit of a tomboy when I was growing up. And when I hit 15, 16 and started getting the attention on the streets... I wrote about it in my in my diary at the time. I was like, three guys looked at me today. And it did. It validated me. And I think, as you said, a lot of women feel validated by people looking at them. But now, as I'm older, like you, I feel disgusted by it. I feel irritated. Mm-hmm. And I feel self-conscious. I've always but, been self-conscious yeah. about it. I've never liked it. I've never liked it. I mean, I'm the kind of person, I mean, in my, in my 20s, you know, people will send a drink down the bar and I remember I'd say to the barman, no, I don't, I don't want to accept a drink from a stranger, especially mm. a guy that hasn't got the balls to just come up and say hello. Yeah. You're very lovely. Who are you? Can I buy you a drink? I'm yeah. not accepting a drink from some some random. Yeah, yeah. But some girls will think, oh, God, this is fantastic. Fuck <laughs> you. <laughs> I'll buy my own drink, man. Amen. And, and I've always been like that. Yeah, yeah. I've always been like that. But there is nothing more beautiful than a man that comes up to you and he's just like, who are you? Mm, That's mm. like, you want to know? Yep. As opposed to the passive the passive it, approach. Yeah. It, yeah. It, but people are just so confused. They don't know what they're doing. Um, you know, I've seen, and I'm not going to name names, but I've seen really famous female presenters in interviews say how flattered they are when, when they're called MILF. Do you know what that stands for? Mm. Do you think that's a compliment? You think what you, what you would like to do to me is something I should be happy about? Mm. And that the fact that my mother has anything to do with it or without it about why I'm attractive and why you'd like to fuck me? 
I don't see that as a compliment. Mm. I think it's disgusting. And that language needs to change. Mm -hmm. So when you've got intelligent women who have influence saying it's a compliment, what are you saying to young girls? Mm. What are you doing? I don't have daughters. I have sons. All I can do is educate them about how to behave around women and how to talk to women and, and know that women are as powerful, if not more so, than men. And that is why we're suppressed. Mm. Because they're so frightened of us. They're so frightened of our power. That's why they've had their boot on the back of our head for so long. Yeah. And it's now really been, um, it's now so transparent, they can't fucking get away with it now because the light's shining on it. Do you think it's just experience and, and, and getting older that's given you the, the confidence to feel comfortable in your own skin? So like on social media, I noticed that, you know, you've changed being more glamorous to being more natural and just being yourself. Yeah, is yeah, that like yeah. a conscious decision or well, do you just evolve the, into the that? Weird, the weird thing is, I've always been like this. Yeah. I've never worn much makeup. Mm. Off camera and off, off photographs. You'll find me like this. You've known me. Have you ever known yeah. me to look any different to this? No, no. No, and that's how I've been. But yeah, there's a glamorous, there's millions of glamorous photographs of me. Yeah. Um, there's there's millions of times where I've dressed up and gone to an event and lo and looked a version of myself. Yeah. Yeah, sure. But definitely now, I'm just, this is it, this is it, this is it. You know, mm. I don't need a stylist. I don't need hair and makeup. I just, this is it. Yeah. And I don't really give a shit about... Um, wearing the same thing over and over again. Mm. I, I used to hate red carpet events. I, I, there, there's many times where I've gone through the back door mm. because I didn't want to do the red carpet mm. or I've rang Alan Cargo and I don't want to do it on my own. Will you do it with me? And he'll do it with me just so I've got that armour because it's the most harrowing, horrible experience. And and But, you know, if you're, if you're promoting something and people forget this, they, they go, but you do loads of things for the newspapers and, and you do the red carpet. You're contracted to do this stuff. And not just that, I think you mentioned something earlier about you've never been to the papers for anything. They find the story and they chop things together themselves to, to promote a narrative about you that you have no choice in. I haven't spoke to the British press for um, three and a half years, probably nearly four. The last yeah. publication I spoke to is Hello magazine way back when. Uh, just because Hello don't, don't really do anything toxic to you, you know, and it's reasonably okay pictures and... Um, and the narrative is pretty much true to what you say. Mm. But the rest of them, I wouldn't talk to them. So anything that you ever read about me now is just some cobbled together pieces of crap from old cuts written by journalists that are lies. So they, I mean, the amount of times over the years, journalists will, will ask me a question based on something that one of their colleagues has written. And I'll go, but that, that was a lie. So don't ask me about a lie that somebody wrote about me. Ask me something of interest. They've never asked me anything of interest so all people know is the same old same old and i'm not going to offer up information to them to be twisted and turned into some other bullshit that doesn't actually represent me at all so the fact is i've stopped talking to them so when they approach you and you say it's a lie do they still print anyway i, mean, I actually did an experiment on instagram the other day i put a picture of me up in venice and i basically hammered them about what they do and how they 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 steal my private life they steal my pictures on instagram and write some shit narrative and I basically put, you probably won't use this, but let's see. And that picture and that narrative has not been <laughs> online. Brilliant. So there goes my yeah. experiment. It's factually happening. Yeah. So, and they, they, I, they, they follow me. They follow me. I know they follow me. I mean, once years ago when I had an absolutely extraordinary happening in my life and it was probably the worst experience of my life and definitely from that moment I have rebuilt and I will continue to grow. But it was a toxic marriage. I was arrested. It was a horrible situation. I was asking him to leave and it escalated. The next day and for the next week or when, however long, I had paparazzi flash photography when I was trying to take the children on a school run. My children were really small at the time. Tino was, is really sensitive to flashing lights because of his autism and all of his condition. I had to put on Twitter because I didn't even have Instagram at the time to say, can you tell, please, to the British press, can you tell your photographers? to not use flash photography in the mornings because my son could go, you know, it could affect him. The flash photography stopped the next day. Okay. They're listening. Yeah. They're yeah. listening and they're reading and they're watching. 
But can I just tell you something recently? And, and, and this is how disgusting these people are. I, I, I met somebody in Venice and he's absolutely a wonderful human being. And on the very first time I met him, I'd got stranded in Venice and we met. And luckily I had the time to get to know him more on this particular trip. And I've had six trips to Venice since because work, I'm starting to work there now as well, which is amazing. Mm. I've so many connections because my magazine is global too. So mm. I'm going to be traveling the world. It's it could be so, worse places to work in. Do you know what I mean? And I, <laughs> I've, I've found where my, my heart is open and it was nothing to do with Ricardo. I, I fell in love with it from the minute I landed. I'd wanted to go there my whole life. And when I got there, my heart was like... Mm. I'm home again. It's another one of those spiritual homes that I didn't know I had, but I knew I had a yearning for it all my life. So it's there. Yeah. And I'm looking... I feel the same way about Venice as well, by the way. It's my favourite city in the world. Yeah. I think I went three times in one year just before, before lockdown. So you, you know. Yeah, absolutely. You know what it does and how it is. And I can be myself there. I can wear what I want there. I don't have that same angst about being seen. Mm. Italian men treat women completely differently mm. they show admiration but it's not in a way that feels threatening it's yeah. extraordinary it's, it's um it's like placing you on a pedestal yeah they have respect yeah i think it's a combination of the water and then the um, the facades the yeah, the, the buildings the the, it's, it's, it's the sky, and the history the, and yeah. oh, everything <laughs> everything i mean i just grew yeah. alive in this place yeah. But so, you, were, you, you were saying something... Because he'd spotted we were being photographed. I don't. I mm. hadn't spotted it, but he'd seen it. And I was like... And every day it wasn't coming in the paper. And I just said to him, I said, it's going to be on Sunday. Sunday morning has the biggest traction and we'll drop it all on a Sunday morning. I left Venice on the Friday. Saturday, nothing in the paper. Sunday, it's all over. Melanie Sykes, toy boy lover, all sorts of fucking weird and horrible, disgusting narrative. I just met some other human being. I met a human being whose heart is as open as mine and we connected and it's that beautiful and that that meaningful mm. and but it's written in such a way I mean they even said they shot they photographed me the following day saying Melanie Sykes looking sheepish after her recent holidays sheepish about what like you should be embarrassed about something or ashamed sheepish it, it yeah. would seem that I should be ashamed of something mm. I did or you're trying to hide something but I'm out and about yeah. looking great taking my Cutting my son out for the day because I'm now back so I can spend the day with my son, getting my car clean, taking a picture of my car because I'm thinking about selling it. And I'm out and about doing my thing and it says sheepish. I'm not sheepish. You're weird. <laughs> but the worst thing about it is so poor Ricardo on the, on the, on the, I leave. Next morning, he takes a photograph in the boat of two British journalists in his boat asking him about me. Oh my God, the poor and it's guy. In, yeah. He's no, he's cool, man. Yeah. He's cool. He's cool. He's just like, look at this. And I, I wanted to put it on Instagram at the time, just yeah. to say, look Shame at the, them. the press that you read every day. They've flown out there to harass someone mm. to sit on his beautiful, precious boat in the most beautiful, precious city in mm. the world. And you brought your toxic piece of shit cells to that moment mm. how shameful are you and you call me sheepish yeah fuck you yeah and i will expose these people i will this is my mission so that's just a tiny bit of it because like i said recently you lie about me you do that about me you go and exploit somebody in a different country for news you're doing it about every single thing mm. on every single level politics the lot and for money mm. They flew over there. They knew what they were doing. They knew they were violating someone else's professional, their personal space. And he had to be professional. He couldn't yeah. chuck them off a boat because he's he's part of the community of gondoliers. There's a yeah. code of conduct. Yeah. So he had to take them for a ride. Can you imagine? Oh. I was just, I'm so sorry. And he's like, it's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. He sounds like a good man. He's amazing. And the more you see it, yeah. his beauty is from within and comes yeah. out. Yeah, it is. You know what? Because there's loads of handsome dudes knocking around, but if they've got no soul, they're, they're, they're just a facade. And mm. who wants a facade? No one. Yeah. No one of note. Yeah. No one of note. So going back to um, to Frank, so you've got this gargantuan journey ahead of you. It's like a, a brand new career, brand new chapter, everything, right? Yes. So do you have any kind of apprehension or feeling of imposter syndrome as you're moving into a complete, not a completely new industry, 
but it is slightly a new industry. Oh, no, no, it is. Yeah. A, for me, it's a completely new industry because one, because there's lots of different levels to it because there's the business side of thing that I am just completely not used to and don't mm. really know. I mean, the only thing that I'd say is I don't owe anybody anything. That's about as, as wealthy as I am. Mm. <laughs> um, it, like, you know, I don't have, I don't, I'm hand to mouth. What can I say? Without going into too much detail, I'm not loaded by any yeah. stretch of the imagination. So this is a big pump for me. And I'm getting people in place that are going to help me hopefully generate money, but also help other women generate money also. Because that's just the way it's going to work. It's you, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. And that's how I want it to be. But in terms of imposter syndrome, um, one of the big things is for me at the moment is and it's all about my voice. Mm. And I can't remember whether we filmed this or not. Did we talk about it before we filmed? Before we did, yeah. Okay, yeah, so yeah. let's talk about it now. <laughs> Is that the more I speak and the more I speak my truth, the more everybody around me and my friends are going, you need to do this. This is what your calling is. Because I've always helped women, you know. Mm. I've always been a voice of reason. I've been able to look at somebody's situation and pick out what they need to do and how they need to change it. But moreover, I'm able to empower them with the way that I say it. Mm. Um, and I've always had women's backs. Um, I'm not saying I've been the perfect person. I've made mistakes. This is true. But I love women mm. and I support them. So I've got to start owning this voice I have and understand that, yeah, I can't give you Reiki. I don't know how to unravel you and open your chakras. I, I, but what I can do is is use words in order to make you feel a different way about what you can do and what you can achieve and mm. how you can be your full potential. And my imposter syndrome is, can you really do that? Are you sure that you're powerful enough to be able to do that? And the fact of the matter is, I, mean, I am powerful yeah. enough to do it. Yeah, I mean, I your, your resilience, your experience, everything you've been through is a lesson in itself. And I think we all have a different take and approach on our experiences and narratives. And I think the way you've taken on yours is incredibly uplifting. Like I've never heard you complain or moan about anything. You say it as it is. If something's effed you off, it's effed you off. Yeah. And it's fact. Yeah. But you don't boohoo and cry into your No, I find a way. You find a solution. I find exactly. a way. I yeah. find a way. I've always found a way. And it's really funny because in, in this amazing treatment I had recently... Um, from from this amazing woman called Katie Blake. And there was a bit in it that I just, this mantra came, find a way, find a way, find a way. And I suddenly realised that's all I've ever done. Mm. That's all I've ever done. Yeah, you don't have a victim mentality. No, I don't. I think if I'd known anyone else that has gone through what you've been through and what people have chucked at you, yeah. they would feel victimized but you're very just you have a, a sense of right and wrong yeah and everything that you are going to do with certain situations in your life comes from a place of wanting to look out for other people not just yourself yeah it's you don't want other people to be impacted or treated the same way that you've been treated and that's your driving force and I think that's really powerful because I think a lot of people want um retaliation from a from a bad place of intent whereas yours is I don't want this to happen to anyone else. Yeah. And and this person or these people need to learn from their mistakes by me showcasing to the world and having a, a light shone on what crap they're doing. Well, exactly. I mean, injustice is 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 the thing that hurts me. Yeah. In in all realms, is the injustice of things. And and it's always been my fire. Mm. Um and so, yeah, you know, you can twist it and say, oh, she's angry. Yeah, because 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 women are angry, aren't they, when they're passionate about things. Mm. But I'm passionate about the right way. Yeah. And um, and I, I'm not fearful to have the conversation. And, and people will write me off. A woman that says anything of no gets written off. Yeah, fuck them. Fuck them. Don't listen <laughs> them. But I'll get people that will listen. Yeah. You know, and and it will be all for the good. Yeah. I got into looking after myself when I was about 38. Um, I was in a marriage that I was really unhappy in. Tino had just been diagnosed with autism. I was working the most I've ever worked in my life in terms of, and now, I'll cut to now. But then I was daytime show, two primetime shows, um, two children under four, not a really happy marriage, strung out, strung out, strung out. And um, I'd been to, to a therapist and, and this therapist had said to me, you know, do you do anything for you? And I was like, no, I've got, don't have any time. And he said, well, you need to find some time for you. Mm. 
So I started going to the gym and um, it was only once a week at first. And then it became twice a week and I started to feel the benefits. And I started to see people's body shapes and how do I get arms like that? And, blah, 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 blah. and then I got really into the gym and, all, and, and it just, my body changed. It was like, and my energy levels were mm. through the roof. And I was extracting myself from the situation I was in. I was gaining power. So I thought, I'll have more of that. And I just have never dropped the ball on it it's in, what is it now, 15 years? Yeah. Well, strong body, years. strong mind. I mean, it's fact. You get told all the time, but you know, your body is phenomenal. I think to be able to maintain what you have takes so much more consistency, dedication, willpower. Yeah, but can I also tell you that once you've got it down, you mu- you've got muscle memory anyway. So yeah. I can go two weeks without training and do anything and, and be in Venice and yeah. just do whatever I bloody want to do and get back to it and get on it. Because I have the discipline to get back onto it. Exactly. And that's the difference. Exactly. Is that I don't let months go by. You know, I've, I've also had back injuries. I had um, a back problem a couple of years ago. I mean, God forbid I was put on tramadol. I took one of those. I was like, fuck that. Mm-hmm. Because that just, I left myself in taking that chemical, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm not interested in doing that. So I had to find another way. But I healed myself mm. with, well, and with the help of my friend who is has her magic hands and just gentle yoga. But also, I really take care of myself. So I don't do um, cardio that pounds my knees. I'm 51, I've got to take care of my joints. So now I'm more yogi. Mm. But lately, I, I noticed I was losing a bit of my shape in my arms and stuff, so I started to do a few more weights. I do it, I see how I feel on any, any given day. Okay. And I operate in that way. So if it's the morning where... Do you know what will suit me better this morning is to actually meditate. I'm going to do that over doing anything cardiovascular or any stretching because actually my mind needs help this morning. Mm. And that sets me off for the day. Or today is a yoga day. Or today is like do some Caroline Gerva and online and get sweaty. Mm. But it's not every day. Only if I want it to be. So that's really what's important because you're listening to your body. I Always. think people resist and fight against what they know is right for themselves in any given moment so they might force themselves to the gym which means that they're not concentrating on their form and I think most of us know who are passionate about exercising if you're not focusing on your form the exercise is pretty much redundant yeah you're only getting like 20 to 30 percent of of the effects or the outcomes that you want if you're not like in it yeah and I think I'm getting to where you are now. So I'm generally very consistent in terms of working out. But these days, I will say, no, I'll go for a walk instead of going on the cross trainer, instead of doing this. Yeah. But what I need to learn from you is the whole spiritual aspect of exercising, because I think being spiritual isn't exercise in itself. And in terms it of is. you need to be consistent. Yeah, with. everything that's good for you needs to be worked on. It's very simple. Nothing comes easy. Nothing that's worth it comes easy. And that's across the board. And that comes with your spirituality. It comes with your exercise. It comes with your, your ethics for work and how you operate. So, so for example, I'm, I, I'm lucky I've been an early riser since the beginning of time. Do you know, and my mum was always one of those people that, you know, you'd hear the hoover go and you'd be like, oh, it's summer holidays and it's only seven and she's hoovering in the living room. It means I'm going to have to get up. And thank God for my mum because I am an early riser. Mm. So I don't miss a trick. And I'm much more, I'm at the desk at half seven sometimes just hammering out shit that, that some people are waiting for nine o'clock to do. Do you know what I mean? Because they've got, you know, their routine's a bit out of whack or whatever. Mine is up. What am I going to do? And I've got, remember, I've got the kids to manage. I mean, Roman's at uni now, so I'm only having him in in pockets of time. But, you know, I hold them emotionally when they're home and they're home a lot. Mm. Um, And I've got Tino to get ready for school, etc. But I just always make sure I get up before them. So I don't have to compromise my spiritual time, my yogi time. And also, just to add, I've been sober now. It'll be five years in May. I've had huge periods of sobriety in my life. Um, Seven years being the longest when I was married to my first husband and having my children and having the career that I was having. But, you know, I've, I've dropped back into it occasionally. and uh, But this time, this is the longest that I've done it for me and me solely. Mm. And it, I will never drink again because it takes me away from my spiritual self. And, and, and it's a shame that I did that. It's a shame that I did that. I feel, 
I've got to protect myself more now. And I actually have self-worth, so I will never drink again. And one of the reasons why I was drinking is because I didn't have any self-worth. Mm. And that goes back to childhood stuff and blah, blah, blah. And it's not to be particularly explored now. But I've been in therapy a lot over my life. I, I swear by it. And the truth of it really is, lately... I've not had any therapy for a while. And the last thing that my therapist, and I've had a few, by the way, because, again, there's been some extraordinary happens in therapy. Because um, people can just behave and be inappropriate to me. That's another thing. I have the most extraordinary happens things that happen to me all the time. It's like I attract... It's supposed slight... to be your safe space. I don't understand. It's happened. Um, people fall in love with me. It's like... And also I think me. that some people find me very entertaining. So actually I think you should be paying me, not me, you. Because they <laughs> laugh at like, well, I'll be in therapy telling them stories about my week. And then people laugh because it is absurd and mad and funny and all the rest of it. It's also really fucking annoying because it's like, this is my life, man. Um, there's never a dull moment. But anyway, getting back to it. Yeah, so putting it in, diarising it, making it happen, but also doing it, do everything based on how you feel. Mm. And, 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 and I have to respect my body mm. and, and my age. What about your what your diet? Are you quite strict? No, again, are I'm you not. Flexible, I'm, go with the flow? I, I used to be. I've been through all the phases you can possibly have. High protein, low carbs, all that for years. Lately, though, in, I'd say in the last three, four years, since I stopped drinking and since I've become a, a more of a yogi person, I am a yogi. That's another label that I used to go, can I say that? Yes, mm-hmm. I fucking can say that. Mm-hmm. I've been a yoga, practicing yoga for how many years now? I think it's like six years or something wow. stupid. So yeah, I'm a yogi. It's all right to say it. That's another imposter syndrome mm-hmm. bullshit. Watching you sit cross-legged. I think I told you before we started recording. You're giving me cramps in my <laughs> hips. I know, but don't sit <laughs> for a minute when I get up. It won't take me a moment because it will, but I'm actually more comfortable yeah, like yeah, this. Yeah. I just am. I just always um, have been. I'm very jealous. I wouldn't be able to get up. Yeah, but yoga is yoga. Yeah. It's yoga. But food, just going back to food quickly, is I, I'm at an age now where, and, and as we discussed before, food is one of the greatest pleasures in life. Um, I am trying to be um, more vegan vegetarian because I care about the environment. And obviously we know that consumption of dairy products is really toxic to the environment, like on a massive scale. So I'm doing my bit for that. I can't go full vegan. I've tried. It's been a tricky. I want to. It's not happening. I'm being honest about it. But what I do do is try to be wherever possible, mm. get that vegetarian and vegan meal in wherever possible. And that's my contribution right now. I've tried. My kids are uh, uh, trying that I've got them off dairy milk and you know mm. I'm doing the bit I mean I've, I've not I've drank dairy for like a hundred years but do you love a steak I love a steak I'm sorry but I do yeah. and I and I will have it every now and again as long as it's it's ethically sourced and it's organic and blah 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 you know mm. I'm not going to eat shit meat I refuse to eat mm. shit meat you know, there's documentaries like Sea Spiracy, you know, when, when they talk about salmon and there's like a, a scale of the colour pink that they can choose to, you know, to put in the salmon. It's just, once you've seen that, yeah. it, you can't buy salmon. Yeah. You know, it's difficult to buy salmon without really looking at where it came from. And these things are important. Yeah. Educate yourself. Watch these documentaries. They get poo-pooed because they would because they affect the fishing industry that generates so much money and nobody wants to highlight that. Well, too bad. Do you think the message needs to be consistent though, because I think people, even like me, so I watch Seaspiracy and I think I was impacted for about a month. So I eat a lot of smoked salmon with bagels. It's kind of my go-to for lunch because yeah. it's quick and it's easy. Mm-hmm. And I didn't buy it for about a month, but then slowly, slowly I started justifying it in my head. Um, and I don't know what the justification was, but I'm now starting to eat salmon again. And I think it's like smoking when... I used to smoke a long time ago. Yeah, me too. Seeing the packet, it works for about five seconds, the shock factor, and then you get used to seeing it. So how, how do you think? Well, it's addiction. Yeah. It's an addiction. Everything everything that we can't give up, really, you can caveat it with it. it's an addiction. Yeah. Everything. And that's the thing as well with the government. They they It's extraordinary. It's like, you know, with the whole pandemic thing, the message was get your vaccine and then you can go to the pub. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. But the pub and what's what's served at pubs is so toxic to your immune system, which it will help you stop getting viruses. So why aren't we promoting healthy immune systems Mm -hmm. in order to fight viruses? Mm. Not stick this in your arm and go and get leathered. Mm. And that is your 
pat on the head for doing as you're told. So I haven't watched TV for about two years. Yeah. I actually disconnected it a couple of years ago. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you, based on what you've said, has there been anything from the government in terms of pushing the whole um, health awareness and how you can reduce your um, likelihood of getting COVID as opposed to getting the vaccine? Or has it literally just been go and get the vaccine? It's vaccine, vaccine. There's no there's no alternative. And for the, for the whole... The, the whole years and years, that, well, the two years that it's been going, a year and a half, blah, 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 there has not been an alternative view. Mm. I, I'm surrounded by people who have an alternative view. I mean, um, you know, my kids are on zinc sprays, we're on B12, we're, we're having Manuka honey. You know, we are um, obviously keeping socially distanced, even though we're, we're, we're allowed to just completely mingle and do whatever we want now. I'm still keeping that space because mm. I think it's smart to do that anyway. I'm being tested all the time when I need to travel. I'm keeping socially distant. I'm, I'm home a lot. Mm. I mean, this new job of mine dictates that I'm indoors anyway. I mean, I've had to quarantine so many times because I've done so much traveling in the last six years. Um, six months that um and I'm fine with quarantining actually I'm really happy you're naturally an introvert anyway, I, yeah I'm you? an introvert and I'm a homebody and and I'm happy doing that and I don't I don't have that burning desire to be in a nightclub or to be around loads of people I, I don't so I'm just going to see how it pans out mm. and keep myself safe and other people and you know I, as far as I'm aware I've never had uh covid all my tests have always been negative. I don't know. So I just feel like I'll just keep going as I'm going until I change my mind. Mm. But I didn't even vote this government in. And um, and and I never will vote for Tories. But So I'm not going to let you dictate to me what I do. Um, so that's how I feel. Yeah. So would you consider yourself anti-vax? No, I'm not. I'm pro-choice. Okay. Completely pro-choice. I think if you feel better for doing it, yeah. do it. Go ahead. I'm like that about everybody, though, and everything. Do what makes you feel good. Mm. I mean, even, like, can we just go back to sex for a minute? So, mm. for example, let me tell you a story. So, I was in Miami years ago, and I'd been sunbathing all day. The guy that I was seeing was working. Um, it got to cocktail hour, and I was sober at the time, and as obviously still am. And this couple came up to me and said, oh, you know, um, we are, we're married, we've got kids, we're on holiday and we'd really love you to join us tonight for, you know, for a party, sex, blah, blah, blah. You know, we've watched everybody today and you're the person we want to fuck. <laughs> so I was like, oh my God, you guys do that? And they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, well, I'm here with my boyfriend. And they were like, well, he can come as well. <laughs> so I was like, I don't think he'll be into it, to be honest. And I said, and to be honest, like, it's not really my style. I said, I can't even have a manicure and pedicure at the same time. Do you know what I mean? It's like too much overwhelm. <laughs> like tapping your head, rubbing <laughs> yeah. your belly. I can't, I can't deal with it. But I was fascinated with their lifestyle and what they did. And I was really fucking flattered. You know, it's really nice to be picked out as somebody mm. that they'd like to, you know, have a night with. So whatever floats your boat, mm. man. How did you turn them down gracefully? No, I didn't. I just said it's not my bag. Yeah. I said it's just not my scene. So good luck with tonight. I hope you find someone. Mm. Have a great time. Were they good looking? Yeah. But I, but I'm a one man woman. Yeah, it, it's yeah. as simple as that. I am yeah. a one man woman. It's it's just the way it is. But if I wasn't, I'd be doing that. Yeah, because I'm free to do what I bloody well want whenever <laughs> I want to, and we all are. Yeah, amen. Uh, right. So, so it is like that with the vaccine. Mm. You know, it is like that with the vaccine. It's like that with every single thing in this world. You know, I'm not here to dictate. I don't believe in dictatorships. But let me have my open mind. You practice yours and it will be a better place. I agree. So this next uh, stage is the fire round. I haven't looked at this bit. I sort of skim read it yesterday. So you, it really is going to be like, you know, whatever comes Whatever out. comes out. When all you right. say quit fire, am I on a timer? No, oh no, no, not at all, not at all. There is no restriction to how, how long your answers okay, are. Okay, cool. Okay, so what three words describe you? Right now, I'd say grounded, um, connected, and spiritual. Mm. What achievement or thing are you most proud of? I'm proud of the parent that I am and the parent I'm becoming. And the older the boys get, the more your parenting comes into play. 
a lot of people say, oh, it's so great when they get to 16, 17, they can look after themselves. I found it the opposite in a way. They need me more now than ever. And because I'm so healthy of mind, more so than I've ever been, I feel like I'm more valuable to them and that excites me. Is it more important to be liked or respected? Yeah, I couldn't give a monkeys about being liked, really. And to be honest, I don't really need to be respected either. I need to like and respect myself. And, and I mean that. Like, I'm not here to change anybody's mind about me. I just need to know who I am and I'm not interested in impressing anybody either. So I don't really need anybody to like me or respect me really, as long as I do that for myself. Mm. Amen. Mm -hmm. If you could be remembered for one thing, what would it be? For being a straight talking, truthful, honest person. And hopefully for being caring and kind. Really, that would make me happy. Well, that's how I see you now. Oh, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you invest, and if so, in what? Uh, I invest in my relationships with everybody um, until such time they might let me down. But mostly, yeah, I spend, I spend my days investing in other people and their experience and how we can co-create and love and and become better people that's an amazing answer okay so what one thing do you want to do before you leave this earth um buy a mushroom coffin have you seen those mushroom <laughs> no. coffins oh my god they're literally made of mushrooms so when you go when you get laid to rest yeah you decompose with the mushroom and become the earth and then you become things that grow from the earth Sorry, it's not the question, the answer that you were probably looking for, but I've just discovered them. It, it, it's an amazing, it's an amazing prospect because they say, do you want to be waste or do you want to be compost? Yeah. And I want to be compost. Yeah. I want to be compost because we get stuck in a wooden box that takes so long to decompose and therefore we take so long to decompose and all this wasted land with just coffins in, we could actually just be wildlife and then someone come and eat you and get high yeah <laughs> yeah man that's what i want to do okay so what's the single most important piece of advice you would leave to another woman well yes to another woman and to all people is speak your truth and um no matter how uncomfortable it might feel to share the truth just do it anyway. Mm. Because I think we're people are lying to each other in small, in small ways all day, every day, whether it be in personal relationships, relationships with um, siblings, with your children, um, it, at work, the, all these little lies, little um, untruths that mm. we hold. It's, you, poison, it's poisonous it, to yourself. So yeah. it's even more for yourself than it is for the other person. It, it, yeah, it's it's just, you know, if you don't say this does not serve me, I'm out or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's just speak your truth always. Amen. Mm -hmm. What does freedom mean to you? Ooh. Um, that's an interesting... What does it mean to me? I feel like I've got... I'm getting there right now, actually, because... Um, I think, I, think, I think you can have it within yourself completely and utterly, freedom to speak, freedom of expression, um, freedom to love who you want, when you want, and all the rest of it. I think, that, I think that financially, I need a little bit of help in terms of freedom with that because I think money does bring freedom. It doesn't bring happiness, but it certainly brings freedom. And for me, freedom means happiness. Mm. So uh, at the moment, say, for example, I'm a little bit restricted in where I live because of money. I'd quite like a little bit more than I've got. And, I, and I'm, it's stressful because I can't quite get there right now. So freedom means being able to be in a property that's not overlooked. Freedom means I can lie in my garden and not anybody see me. Freedom means I can move around the place without being watched. I have that scenario that goes on. Nothing that I do ever gets on. I just can't operate in a way that other people do. And I don't know how A-list big time celebrities do it, but their money helps them be mm. in places and get to places in a way that they are free. Mm -hmm. And um, protected and private. And private. And my privacy is everything to me. Um, and so, and so, yeah, freedom will be when I can just 
I'm getting there. Mm. It's caring less about the being watched that will unlock my freedom, to be yeah. honest. So who or what inspires you? Or both? Um, there's lots of people that inspire me. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a politician called Angela Rayner. She's, you know, big time. I don't even know what her, her, her job title is. She just got um, promoted. And she's in the Labour Party. She's actually from my hometown. And she she's a powerhouse. She speaks the truth day in, day out. She's in, in she's in a she's in a world that's just full of men. Mm-hmm. Um, and she just is fearless. And I love her. And I'm gonna get to meet her soon. We're you gonna will. Yeah, well, oh, we are. Is it is it lined up? It's happening. Amazing. I reached out <laughs> to her and she's like, yeah. So I'm going to be talking to her. There's just loads of women in business. There's women in politics. There's there's women all over the globe that are doing amazing things. And I'm just hats off, respect, want to know what makes them tick. Um, how can I get involved? What can I do? So there's loads of people like that. Um, in, inspiration. Did you say inspiration? Mm. I get inspired by um, paintings. I get inspired by m- moon rises and sunsets mm. and... Um, with nature, I get inspired being out and about. Um, um, I'm inspired by everything I read, everything I see, every conversation I have with everybody. My sons inspire me daily. They give me this like new way of thinking. I, I, I Just everything around me inspires me. You feel like a sponge. I am. I am. I'm having to write stuff down in the middle of the night. I mean, it's just, it's mad how mm. much it's happening. That's exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. And I think my sensitivity and my openness to all these things was in a way something was one of the reasons why I drank because I couldn't handle all of the... The inputs. The input. Yeah. And now I'm like, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. Take it and run with it. Don't hide from it. Don't be fearful of it. Don't numb it. Embrace. And yeah, and educate myself with all that's happening. And yeah, and it just keeps me going. So if I was a genie... I could mm. grant you one wish. Yeah. Oh, what God. would you wish for? Well, I know it's a cliche, but world peace for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, for us to really start putting the brakes on the climate change um, a- as a global collective, just get on it. Mm. Just get on it and slow it down. Yeah. Slow it down, turn it round, just change how we... And it's, it's sorry, it's not one thing, but it's just the fabric in the way that society is set up needs to be broken down and rebuilt. Mm. But I think you're going to have a big hand in that. I know it's just little old you and what you're doing with your with your platform, but I think every little helps. Uh, well, that's what I'm yeah. trying to say. And that's try, I'm, it's almost like trying to find disciples on it. There's yeah. been people doing it before me. My dad was been doing it in the 70s. There's people, young people like Dara McAnulty, who I've just re- read his book, Diary of a Young Naturalist. He's an activist. You know, you've got all these young people. I actually want to support them. In fact, on the website, I want to have a whole place for young people who are doing amazing things in the world because mm. they are the future they are going to have to deal with the future if we you know i've got you know friends of my age and stuff like that and their kids are begging them to do some stuff to help the environment because unfortunately people of my generation some of them a lot of them don't even tap into it mm. so it's it's global stuff it's structural societal stuff that I would love to see changed in order for us to survive Mm. so it's a big thing it's a big ass it is it's huge um we spoke a few weeks ago about success and I think you had a very different spin on success to what I'm used to hearing um particularly in my industry and profession where success equates to Um, very tangible, specific outcomes, Mm. um, largely financial or accolades or or something of that nature. And um, I really liked your interpretation of what success means to you. So what does success mean to you? Yeah, I've forgotten what I said. You said something along the lines of um, being a good mother, being happy in yourself. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, for me... 
the yes, I understand why people have like those goals and those monetary success stories. And you know, you know, I I was in a business sort of conference the other day, and this woman said that she she'd won an award or she'd applied for an award and she'd been given it. I'm not interested. That's not success to me. Mm. Um, success is being happy in myself and strong enough in myself and being grounded enough to make change, mm. whether it's be in my son's life or in the woman next door or um, the world at large. It, it, if I'm happy and grounded and healthy enough to be active in that, then that's success for mm. me. That's, I really like that. Yeah, because I don't think we can operate in any other way because it's all very well making the money. and the, But if you as a person, you're not right, you're not quite grounded, you're not having personal relationships that are working well for you because you're operating on lies, all of the money and all of the success of an industry and a job mean nothing. Mm -hmm. They literally mean nothing. So it isn't success. By definition, that's not successful. What, what's, what's important is how you are and how you feel. And that that's that's success. And I feel like finally mm. I'm getting somewhere very close to it. That's amazing. Yeah, it's I so mean... exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of goals, are you a goal-oriented person or are you an evolution person? So do you have a few goals that you're aiming? Yeah, I've got do? goals. I've okay. actually got goals for the first time, actually. Like I, I know exactly where I want to be and where I want to live and what I want to do. I know that I've got um, documentaries to make and I know I've got to actually get into a zone where I've got I've set up a production company and need to start making them and, and learning and doing all those things. And I've got a, a plan of action regarding that. And further, what I've been told by quite a few of my friends is that I need to pace myself mm. because I am, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, and I've, got, I've got to get onto it. And, and it, I feel like even now, the launch isn't happening. We were delayed this week. And I was like, oh. And the fact is, we're not ready to launch this week, really. Mm -hmm. But I'm launching. Mm -hmm. Because even though it might, it's still going to look beautiful. It's still going to have what it needs on there. But it will be, it's a work in progress. And yeah. I'm not going to keep it's holding. It's MVP. What's that mean? I'm minimal, vi minimal viable product. And it's something, it's just good enough. It has to be good enough for you to get started because I think you can iterate and iterate and iterate on top of that. But when you wait for something to be perfection to you, other people might not care about what that perfection looks like. It's Absolutely. about getting it out there, getting eyes on it, getting feedback, insights, and then just evolving as you go along. And, uh, and also because I'm so, my evolution is fast track beyond. I mean, it, I'm supercharged. I mean, I'm using terms that my spiritual friends use on me when they mm. see me and hear me. Like, Jesus, you're supercharged. I'm like, cool, I like the idea of that. And even from morphing from a bi-monthly magazine for women over 40 to an online platform with rolling content for all women with a sustainable edge, even from making that decision to now, the evolution in me has been massive. Mm. I'm much more political now. I'm much more right on, man. It's like, and I actually looked at the content that I've created. And also while I've been trying to can get content, I'm also setting up a business. I'm also putting contracts into play. Mm -hmm. I'm also finding a tribe that can help me. I'm also, I'm also, I'm also- Employing people. Yeah. All of that. All of that stuff that I've never done before. So when we finally came to start to put the stuff up for the, for the website, I suddenly thought, Fuck, it doesn't even properly represent where I'm at now. Mm. So I've evolved quicker than the magazine. Mm. But I've also been doing so much to get the thing up and running. So it is just going to have to be what it is when it launches this week. Yeah. And then we'll grow from there. And, and that's it. And I'm not afraid to do that. I'm not afraid to do that because I'm flawed. I'm human. Mm -hmm. Um, the website is a reflection of me and that will have gaping holes in it because I've not been able to do whatever I've needed. But I, I don't care. Mm. I don't care. You're going to smash it. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> I have no doubt in my mind. <laughs> I'm just not worried about anybody seeing the real side of me yeah. or it. Yeah. This is so exciting. I think in the blurb that I wrote uh, pre-interview, I said, I don't have anyone in my life that makes me feel so kind of at peace and energized at the same time, That's amazing. which is a really strange juxtaposition. Uh -huh. um, but you do that. So I'm excited, but I'm also really calm. It's very strange. Yeah, but that's so you so have good. a power. Ah! <laughs> I think I'm... you might be hypnotizing me. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> oh well, this is good. This yeah. is good. I mean, the one thing I wish I had, like I'm, I'm, but uh, but I also have talked to somebody about this, and I'll, I'll just quickly tell you this: is that I don't have that mellow nature. You're very mellow, and you're very laid back. Once I start. I get so, so, it just pours out, pours out, pours out. I don't have that ability to just quietly give the information. And I I was talking to a friend the other day. I'm like, do I need to change the dynamic in which my, I think I might have talked to you about mm. it, actually. Do I need to change how I say these things? And the answer comes back with a resound, no, you do not. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going with that. Because I'd like to be this mellow Zen person um, that can just speak these amazing words of wisdom <laughs> and be so. But and that's boring. I can't. It's not even boring. It's wonderful. <laughs> I just can't do it myself. Yeah. And you can only be yourself. Yeah. And I don't. I don't formulate what I say. It just is what it is. Yeah. But so, you always say inspirational and um, timely things. That's that's how I'm going to leave it. You say lots of timely things. Well, that's fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Ms. Melanie Sykes. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Dan. That's really great. Subscribe to Tonics Firm for more conversations with real and powerful women giving you insights into their unique journeys to success. My name is Danielle Dodu. I am your host. Have a productive and fabulous day.